Good morning. Welcome to the third session of Informa's Immuno Oncology Webinar Series. Today's topic is immunotherapy cancer combinations, when, who, and at what price. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join today's webinar. I'll get to some housekeeping items a little later, but first let me introduce our panel. My name is Mary Jo Laffler, and I will be your moderator today. I'm currently Bureau Chief for Clinical Development and Business News for the Pink Sheet Group, where I've spent the last 15 years reporting on the pharmaceutical industry. I'm joined today by Dr. Beth Nash, Chief Medical Officer of Real Endpoints, a healthcare analytics company. She is a former infectious diseases clinician and has over 20 years of experience in managed care, publishing, product development, and consulting. Dr. Joshua Brody is an assistant professor in hematology and medical oncology and the director of the lymphoma immunotherapy program at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Dr. Brody's current research focuses on two areas, lymphoma immunotherapy and a class of targeted therapies called B-cell receptor signaling inhibitors. With clinical focus in chronic lymphoid leukemia, cutaneous lymphomas, follicular lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, and post-transplant lympho lymphoproliferative disorders, his lab at the Mount Sinai focuses on basic and applied tumor immunology. Rachel Mian Mantha is a principal analyst with the oncology team at Sightline. She has a PhD in cell and molecular biology from Boston University and conducted postdoctoral research at the Lombardi Cancer Center at Georgetown University and at the Holland Laboratory, American Red Cross. Before joining Sightline, she worked as a scientist in genetic and molecular toxicology at Covance. And Patricia Riley is the executive director of MedTrack Editorial Operations and has been a leader of MedTrack and Sightline teams for 10 years. She has 15 years of pharma experience in drug discovery, as a research scientist in cell and molecular biology for Beringer Ingelheim, and later as a principal analyst in inflammation immunology for competitive, competitive assessment involving in licensing and new target proposals at Beringer. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping, housekeeping items and let you know how to participate in today's webinar. First, you should have a control panel on the right side of your screen. Towards the bottom of the control panel is the Q&A pane. You may submit questions or comments in writing using the Q&A pane during the presentation. Your questions will be answered either during the webinar or after the webinar by email. Today's webinar is being recorded, and everyone will receive an email with a link to view a recording of today's event. So let's get started. <clears throat> the, uh, the greatest promise of, immun of immunotherapy appears to be the ability to layer different interventions together, be that all immunotherapy regimens or combinations with other types of drugs like targeted therapies or chemotherapy. So far we have one immunotherapy-immunotherapy combination on the market, Bristol-Myers Squibb's P1 inhibitor Optivo and its PTLA4 inhibitor Yervoy in melanoma. Uh, but there's certainly a lot more coming. Rachel, can you get us, st us started, um, walk us through the lay of the land in terms of what sponsors have active clinical trials for combinations and on what diseases? Thank you, Mary Jo. Yes, I would be happy to walk you through the landscape. What you're seeing in this first, first chart is a um, chart of all the, I should say, the top 10 sponsors. They were identified in terms of their trial counts in immunotherapy combinations either as a sponsor or as a collaborator. Um, we at Sightline identified these uh, sponsors and their trial counts. This analysis was done back in uh, December 2015. And so what you're seeing are just the top 10 sponsor collaborators. You'll see the top 10 disease types in which these immunotherapy combinations are taking place. Um, they are melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, head and neck cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, cancer, renal cancer, prostate cancer, and multiple myeloma. What I want to point out on this slide is, in particular, are the differences that you see between the sponsors and where they are focusing their attention for these immunotherapy combinations. First of all, you can see that Bristol-Myers Squibb has certainly focused a lot on their on melanoma. And you can also see that they have spent a lot of um, effort in non-small cell lung cancer and multiple myeloma. Roche, Merck, and AstraZeneca are also focusing on non-small cell 
lung cancer. GlaxoSmithKline seems to be focusing on chronic lymphocytic leukemia, Novartis as well, and then you can round it out with Celgene, Advi, and Biothera. They seem to be focusing on most on multiple myeloma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Next slide, please. With this chart, you see that, um, again, the same top 10 sponsors identified by their trial counts, um, but we are looking now at their, the status of these trials. Um, you can see that all these sponsors are currently conducting trials, as shown with the red bars. Um, they also have, most of them have completed trials, and you can see that with the tan bars. There are some terminated trials, as you would expect, and hopefully some news about some closed trials, and that's the purple bar. Um, and then what's healthy to see is that there are also quite a few planned trials. You can see that with the top four sponsors, AstraZeneca, Merck, Roche, and Bristol-Myers Squibb, you also can see that um, Biothera, AbbV, Celgene, uh, Novartis, and Pfizer are planning, have some trials that are planned. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline, at, as of December 2015, did not have any trials that were planned. But, Next slide, please. But a, f a fair number that were up, and just to sort of note, I think these data sets give us a good look at, at which companies are, are really in the lead. Um, you see the bristles out in front and seems to have a, a growing, growing lead with more and more approvals and submissions. And, Merck is the only other company with a marketed immuno-oncologic and is still investing heavily. Um, Roche should enter the market soon, and uh, Pfizer and AstraZeneca are, are approaching too. Um, you can see that many of the, the later entrants have focused more on combinations. Uh, Roche taking advantage of its very broad pipeline, and uh, AstraZeneca has really prioritized combinations sort of over monotherapy for, for its uh, PD-L1 inhibitor, Gravelimab, and is trying to make the most of having the only other late-stage CTLA-4 inhibitor, Tremolimumab, uh, and it also went it into a, a major partnership with Celgene to get a jump on hematology. Uh, but this is interesting to see uh, the number of, of other sponsors moving agents along, particularly in combinations. Um, I know you've got more slides. Could you sort of give us an overview of how far advanced these programs are? and, and Yes. Uh, again, it's, you can see that the, as represented by these top 10 sponsor collaborators that, um, as you would expect, you see a range of trials from very early phase, phase one trials, all the way through to late stage trials, um, stage three. Um, as you can tell, Bristol Mouse Squibb has been um, conducting many trials, both in monotherapies and in combinations, they're way out ahead in terms of trial count, um, and they are also conducting quite a few late-stage trials um, with phase two and phase three. And that's not to say that the other, some other sponsors, GlaxoSmithKline in particular, has a lot of phase two trials. Um, AstraZeneca, Merck, and Roche all have a healthy number of phase three trials, um, as do Novartis and Pfizer. Um, and then you see some of the smaller companies again with, you know, the early stage phase one and phase one two, but they also have a fair number of phase two trials as well. It's interesting to see that sponsor by sponsor, um, but we're seeing a lot of, of companies working together. Uh, Patty, could you give us a sense of what's been going on in terms of cross-company collaboration? Sure. Um, so shifting uh, from the trials to sponsorships and collaborations, um, we took a look at trends in the immuno-oncology agreements between biopharma companies over the past five years. So as you can see from this uh, slide, agreements have dramatically shot up and have doubled from 2014 to 2015. The beginning of 2016 has already started out with a good number of agreements so I think we're well on our way to seeing another big year for collaboration. As interest in the combining of checkpoint inhibitors with other immunotherapy rises and the field of immuno-oncology becomes more competitive, 
the number of agreements has risen dramatically. Biopharma companies realize that there's a huge number of possibilities for combinations using double and triple uh, regimens. And no one knows which regimens are, which combinations will work for which types of cancer, and more importantly, what these combinations will mean for patients. And new target, uh, cancer targets will certainly expand. For example, gastric cancer is an area of exploration as companies look beyond melanoma and lung cancer. Knowing that pharma companies can't develop multiple types of inhibitors in-house rapidly and to remain competitive, companies are looking to expand agreements to cover all types of possibilities. The external collaborations have encouraged all company types as well uh, between big pharma as well as big pharma and small pharma and biotech. And this is all in pursuit of ultimately exposing you know, cancer cells to the body's own immune system. So um, with so many combination trials underway, can you show us which drugs are, are being paired up most often? Well, first I'd like to show you who's leading um, in the number of agreements thus far. So it's pretty obvious from this slide who the key players are in the field. Uh, Keytruda has certainly been involved in the largest number of agreements, and BMS is not far behind with external collaborations. And this slide doesn't include um, any kinds of trials that BMS is doing with its uh, own two drugs. Um, so Yerve and Alpiva. So you can see that uh, the number of companies going into this, have, they have quite a few uh, agreements ongoing. So to your next question, um, looking at the targets that are involved in these agreements, uh, we see the following trends in um, this slide. The graph includes targets from the past five years, and these are really the results of combinations where at least one of the targets is an immune checkpoint. And we only graphed um, drugs that were involved in either six or greater agreements. So this doesn't include, uh, also doesn't include companies that were you know, using two of their own drugs or using a generic drug, and it really only included um, sponsors where the sponsor was the originator. So we didn't include any um, combinations where uh, the trials were done at the National Cancer Institute, for, uh, for example. Um, certainly, uh, currently you can see that most of the expensive deal making is centered around the PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. So in this slide, we uh, once again, we only included combinations where there were uh, four or more combination agreements, where at least one of those therapies was uh, an immune checkpoint. And we can see from this that um, there are a number of different examples of therapies on the slide. We have small companies like Biothera. Um, we have uh, agreements with older, um, using older drugs like Rituxan um, with BMS's drug for CLL and Rituxan with Keytruda. Um, so uh, basically, we finally are um, see that as understanding increases and new approaches emerge, we think we're going to see uh, steady growth in licensing agreements and collaborations uh, with a focus on now on results and possibly the new second generation of immunotherapy drugs and then finally possibly a shift from um, partnerships to M&As as results come available and more focus is given on very specific drugs. Great, thanks. With, with so much in the works and, and one combination therapy already on the market, um, people are looking towards the next step. How are these going to be priced and how will they be received by payers? Beth, you've looked at immunotherapy pricing quite a bit. What can you share with us? Yeah, well, when we speak with payers, um, they are definitely taking notice uh, of the rising prices for cancer drugs. And they report to us that cancer costs generally are their highest priority. And in fact, there are three separate value frameworks uh, that have been developed to address the high prices of cancer drugs. So the first is the ASCO value framework. 
The second is from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, who have created what they call evidence blocks. And the third uh, is what you're looking at right now, which is drug abacus, which was developed at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And in drug abacus, uh, the end user can decide what uh, attributes of a cancer drug are most important to them uh, can, and can then calculate uh, a price uh, based on the data for that drug. So what you're looking at here is that if the end user were to value a year of life at $120,000 and discount toxicity by 15%, the predicted price of the immuno-oncology drugs would be much lower than their current prices. Now, so far, payers are not doing much about this, but we do expect the situation to change. But first, it's important to understand how payers actually go about controlling drug costs. So the first um, is in commercial insurance, um, payers can limit use, and they do this uh, through utilization management. So that includes requiring prior approvals where the doctor has to um, get permission to use the therapy or step therapy where a patient needs to try and fail a lower price uh, treatment and then can move on to the more expensive therapy. The second way uh, commercial insurers uh, control uh, things is by managing costs. And in this case, what they're doing is by formulary placement. So a, a drug uh, gets a preferred position uh, on a formulary. Medicare, however, is quite different. Um, and oncology drugs are a protected class. Uh, so essentially, substantially all oncology drugs must be made available. And utilization management techniques um, for limiting use are only possible uh, for new starts of therapy. Thanks. Um, that's a helpful overview and, and really lays the, the groundwork. Um, for the already marketed immuno-oncology drugs, what sort of reception are they getting with payers? So what you um, see here is a summary of um, some work that we've done talking to payers um, about their preferences for Opdivo versus Keytruda in patients with non-small cell lung cancer and with melanoma. And so far what's happening is payers do not appear uh, to publicly have significant impact on the choice of uh, PD-1. Um, but um, and, and also, in addition to that, they are not requiring use of the pd one uh, diagnostic test to date. Um, and this is um, despite the fact that Keytruda uh, was approved for non-small cell lung cancer for patients whose tumors express pd one Now, the pd one biomarker um, is expressed on certain tumor and this testing is the first companion diagnostic uh, for any of the checkpoint inhibitors. One thing that's interesting to note uh, is that one national payer recently altered their policy to state that Keytruda for non-small cell lung cancer uh, was only indicated in patients with, um, who had pdl one positive disease. We suspect that at this point in time, they're going to take the physician's word uh, for the uh, positive test, but this is likely uh, to change. One thing that's um, interesting to note as well is we're talking here about public policies. Uh, it's also possible that there are some hidden preferences going on. For example, an increasing number of provider contracts involve risk sharing. Um, and providers may be incentivized to use cheaper treatment options in those sorts of contracts. But these contracts are all confidential. So are you expecting reimbursement to become more difficult with more drugs entering the market? 
and as the drugs are increasingly used in combination, um, and like some of the things you're talking about, are there other measures payers are taking to control utilization and cost? Yeah, so payers are definitely uh, taking notice, um, but have not uh, implemented uh, significant measures to control costs yet. However, Express Scripts um, has said that they will introduce indication-specific pricing for selected cancers by the end of the first quarter of 2016. So what this means is that there will be differential uh, pricing for different indications depending on the efficacy in that particular indication. Looking um, at the next slide, what you see is um, how uh, combination therapies um, are being priced. And um, again, we, the payers have not really uh, taken notice uh, as yet, but it's really interesting to see that Bristol has priced the combination at only 6% higher than your, vo your boy alone. Um, this does seem like novel pricing, but we actually took a look at this in a little uh, more detail, and we believe that this is just a function of the fact that Opdivo is a fifth the price of your boy, and that the dose of Opdivo is significantly cut um, for the, common, the period of combination therapy. So the pricing in our mind is not really novel. Um, but we do expect as time goes on that payers will do the math and take a closer look at some of these uh, creative pricing strategies and be more on top of them. I think we've also seen some, some companies really acknowledging that there, this is going to be a problem, the sort of so-called stacked biologics problem as you start to use um, multiple expensive biologic therapies, um, and Roche has, has done a lot to test different models in emerging markets, and, uh, and we could eventually see, see more of that, um, especially as different indications and different lines of therapy push the cost curve. Um, and I, I know Bristol chose to make your voice free in the adjuvant setting. Is, is that something you sort of see as, as another sign of creativity to come? or? Yeah, so what we're thinking um, about the, um, the Yervoy uh, being offered free in the adjuvant setting is, first of all, this is a very small patient population, maybe a little more than 3,000 patients. Um, and it's likely that Bristol finds it cost-effective to give the drug away uh, for three years in such a small population rather than having to deal with reimbursement policies. Um, I also wonder um, if it isn't sort of a goodwill gesture to make Bristol look very positive in the eyes of physicians and encourage perhaps the use of your boy in other settings. Interesting. And, and we do have a, our physician right here. Um, Dr. Brody, what has your experience been uh, working with payers? With, with immunotherapy? Um, my experience has been, for me, surprisingly positive in that uh, we've had maybe more leeway than I would have expected. I'm not sure if that's confounded by the fact that I work at an academic center and uh, somehow they give us some uh, consideration. But let me point out it is differential, so certainly we've gotten a fair amount of leeway with uh, anti-PD-1 antibodies, um, using them uh, easily for the FDA approved indications, as was hinted, without any PDL1 biomarker submitted, even a reference to our own interpretation of that. And just to comment on uh, your thoughts, that we'll have to take the physician's word on it. Other than literally sending sending the samples in uh, centrally to Merck, uh, I don't think that we'll ever have a reproducible assay. Uh, if we all check uh, our LDL or cholesterol in this room, a hundred different labs, we get almost the same answer. But uh, checking the PDL1 immune chemistry between uh, five pathologists will give us five different answers. So it's very hard to say that that test is reproducible yet, even if it's uh, qualitatively pretty good. Hard to quantitatively reproduce it. So it's hard to see that in the near term, even for that one payer you mentioned that's starting to recommend it, uh, that it be required. 
So PD-1 for FDA approved indications have been uh, easy antibodies to get. And uh, in all honesty, for non-approved indications have also been remarkably easy to get. Uh, hematologic malignancies, that are solid tumors. And I'm, I'm just guessing that's because it's early days and uh, people have heard on the side of that. By contrast, ipilimumab has been much more difficult to get. And my understanding is that it's not just because of the price, but that's because of the increased toxicity of, uh, of anti-CTLA-4 antibodies that uh, <laughs> payers are less eager to be associated with bad outcomes that might be associated with that. I'm sure the money is probably not, uh, it's not nothing either. Uh, so our experience has been so far surprisingly quite good. Thanks. And, you know, at, at medical meetings and, and, and just talking with physicians, you know, it seems that a lot of clinicians have become more and more concerned about the cost of oncology drugs. And, and at ASCO last year, a lot of presenters started talking about financial toxicity alongside the safety and efficacy data. Uh, so, Dr. Brady, put you on the spot again. As a clinician, how does price affect your treatment decisions? I think we worry about uh, financial toxicity the same way we worry about global warming. We don't actually stay up at night freaking out about it. We know it's a bad thing, but maybe we're willing to change our lives to a degree to accommodate that bad future. But it's uh, for us by far a second or tertiary priority when you have a sick patient in front of you. Uh, it's hard, to t hard for us to think about money and certainly even crazier to think about telling them about uh, financial considerations. So we, we, we worry about it in the same way as global warming. We want someone else to fix it. Uh, we don't want to have to fix it. Uh, uh, I think the financial toxicity is a real thing. Not for just immuno-oncology, for every new cancer medicine. I don't think, that, I mean, you pointed out the distinction of immuno-oncology being even more overpriced than other things, but there are a lot of expensive medicines. and. You know, some even more so than immunology are being used for years per patient, uh, and I think it's a little harder to, well, I think that's factored into the advocates that you showed, the Sloan Kettering advocates, but, uh, uh, but some of these other medicines are used for even much longer. So I think there's a lot of expensive medicines. I think that uh, we will go bankrupt uh, if we continue in this direction. Uh, as individual oncologists, uh, and, and I'm sorry, let me get distinguished uh, that an academic probably has a slightly different perception of this than a community doc. Uh, where if they're getting delayed reimbursements or non-reimbursements, that you know, keeps them from paying their rent or putting their kids to, uh, through school, whereas uh, in academia we're a bit insulated from that. So we think about it uh, cerebrally. It doesn't come into our practice day to day. We probably do have a bunch of people in our pharmacy registration uh, cohort who do think more about this versus that, Ketruda versus uh, Optivo, et cetera. Um, I think we think about it only in an abstract way, and so far, it has not impacted our bottom line. I'll just give one brief contrast of that. So I'm, I'm instructed in financial meetings never to say the word Provenge uh, or Dendrion, but we can't ignore the precedent or lack thereof. But that was not getting utilized, first because of its moderate efficacy, or some people would say questionable efficacy, I would say moderate efficacy, um, and probably also because community oncologists who were seeing these patients didn't want to shell out 90000 uh, and maybe get reimbursed X months later. Um, so, I mean, there definitely was an impact there. Uh, it was not the home run that, uh, or the, at least you know, triple base hit that, uh, that anti-PD-1 is uh, for most cancers. Yeah. The, the checkpoint inhibitors are proving to be a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But there is some precedent of, of, of pushback from community oncologists when the price is exorbitant uh, and they're not as confident in the efficacy. Melanoma, lung cancer, bad diseases, bad options, clear efficacy, it's a no-brainer. Uh, with more marginal efficacy, there's a precedent of a community oncologist pushing back by not using the medicines. Thanks. Beth also mentioned the PDL1 diagnostic, um, which has been a, a rather controversial biomarker in that it changes, testing can be very varied, uh, there's still response in marker-negative patients. Um, and there's a lot of work going into identifying more biomarkers from immuno oncology. Um, Dr. Brody, what is your experience in terms of, of patient selection using biomarkers, either if you do the PD-01 testing, um, or if you, if, you know, will having biomarkers help you make treatment decisions? And if so, what do you, what do you need to feel confident in the biomarker and that it predicts for the drug? Uh, this is a tricky one because it really almost goes cancer by cancer. Let me speak to the approved a bit and, and then also acknowledge my 
expertise and lack thereof in some histology. So I'm a lymphoma, CLL doctor. So, you know, I think a lot about melanoma. I take care of these patients uh, briefly, but I'm not a, an expert in this disease. So nonetheless, we can't ignore the huge, uh, for melanoma very specifically, the huge impact that a biomarker would have here, which is not that you wouldn't give, it's, it's not quite the simplest interpretation, it's not that you would or wouldn't give PD-1 antibody to a melanoma patient. Every single one of them is going to get an anti-PD-1 antibody uh, at some point, probably earlier rather than later. The real question for them is whether they get combo versus monotherapy. So uh, pd one positive patients, anti-PD-1 by itself, almost as good as combo uh, PD-1 plus CTL-4 blockade. pd one negative patients, now uh, ipilimumab adds a lot of benefit to those patients. And it's a medicine we wouldn't, as I mentioned, otherwise want to give if we didn't have to because of its toxicity. So um, how close to a standard of care that will be, I mean, to me that's almost a no-brainer standard of care going forward, not maybe today where PD-L1 immune system chemistry is not universally available, not by a long shot. Um, uh, but going forward, if my relative had melanoma and they were pd one negative, I'd want to give them combo therapy. If they're pd one positive, I'd give them, uh, I'm sorry, I hope I said that right. Yeah, pd one negative, I'd give them combo therapy. I hope that's what I just said. And PD-1, uh, PD-L1 uh, positive, I'd give them anti-PD-1 monotherapy. Um, so that's for melanoma. Whether we'll get that combo, and that combo, as you saw from some of those, uh, we call them swimming histograms, some of those sideways histograms you showed, uh, P, uh, PD-1 plus anti-CTLA-4, both in BMS and also anti-PD-L1 plus TREMI uh, from uh, Metamune, uh, AstraZeneca, sorry, um, uh, is being, is, you know, the most frequently looked at combinations just because of the precedence. Uh, whether, whether that will pan out for any other cancers, and have that same story of PDL1 picking apart the benefit of uh, adding in the second more toxic agent. Uh, it's hard for me to guess. Um, so that's all about PDL1 biomarker to distinguish between monotherapy uh, and combo therapy. The more, I don't know, straightforward question is just using PDL1 to decide do I use an anti PD1 antibody or not. So for melanoma, we never will. Um, for lung cancer, you could argue we would, but that's not American to go backwards in what we offer people, you know. Uh, Americans would never accept, wait, three years ago you would give me this medicine, but now if I'm testing negative you won't? That's not fair. And Americans are very entitled and it's hard to fight with them. Um, so it's hard to see that for things like lung cancer would ever go, I'm going to put this in quotes, you can't see my air quotes, go backwards um, in terms of availability of the medicine. So it's more about going forwards, how we'll use PDL one So it's more about how the companies will expand to new cancers with PDL one testing. Uh, and, I mean, we were talking about uh, trastuzumab perceptin uh, before the conference, and obviously this is uh, the paradigm of biomarkers where we have a medicine that would be a failure without the biomarker. If you give it to all breast cancer patients, it's a failure, but if you give it to her to new positive patients, then it's a success. So going forward, we'll you know, be able to pull out subsets of pancreas cancer, uh, subsets of gastric cancer. Uh, we already have a, a subset of colon cancer, which is uh, PD-1 sensitive. Uh, but we will pick out subsets of those patients and uh, and treat them with uh, PD-1 blockade. I think we will. The sort of near-term recent precedent of that is uh, maybe CD30. Again, this is on the verge of immune oncology or just targeted chemotherapy. But uh, CD30 antibody drug conjugate uh, approved for Hodgkin's anaplastic large cell lymphoma is sort of I don't know softly getting approved for CD30 positive malignancies more broadly. So if you're CD30 positive, you can get the medicine. That's um, not an FDA fact, that's more of an on-the-ground trend, I think. Uh, and I think in the future there, that will be pdl one positive patients, almost regardless of histology, uh, will be able to get some attempt at a pd one blockade. That's my um, prediction. I think you covered a lot of ground there, and I can promise you really did use the air quotes. Yeah, I had my fingers. Yeah. They look like little uh, money ears. If I, if I, and maybe, maybe you're avoiding it. On purpose, but you're doing you do a lot of research as well. Mm -hmm. Are there experimental biomarkers coming along, or things that are being tested that you think have promise, or is it too soon to tell? There are experimental. I mean, I'm going to use one more air quotes. Experimental. I mean, the air quotes are there because some of these are already pretty good, um, uh, promising biomarkers. I'll just list a couple of examples. Um, the question is, are they good? The question is, are they better than PDL1, or are they do uh, do they Add on top of PDL1, um, and we're not, I'm not. I don't think we're quite sure about that yet. The uh, most obvious examples are 
just the number of T cells uh, either in the tumor or in the invasive at the invasive margin of the tumor. Um, this has been known, uh, at least since the beginning of checkpoint blockade, that uh, you know, the purpose of anti-PD1 antibody is to release the brakes on CD8 T cells. At least that's the primary belief uh, as to its function. And uh, so if there are no T cells, there are no CD8 T cells, and there's nothing to cut the brakes on. Um, so CD8 T cell infiltration to the tumor is a pretty good biomarker. I'm not absolutely sure how much it adds on top of PDL1. It adds a little bit uh, of distinct and separate information. Um, a much fancier, very elegant and mechanistically for us important biomarker that really kind of tells us how we think these anti-PD1 antibodies are working um, is the somatic mutation burden of any given tumor, tumor class, melanoma as a histology, or even in, 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 in individual patients, um, somatic mutation uh, tumor burden. That's a fancy and expensive test and far from ready for prime time. Um, and there are different ways of doing that. The simplest way, and it's still not simple, is to basically genome the entire patient. It's not quite the genome. We say just run the exome of the entire patient. Again, that took, you know, 10 years when we did the first one in 2000. Now we can do it in about a week. But a week's still a long time. And it, you know, cost a uh, billion dollars the first time. Now the price is down to about $1,200. But that's still a lot of money. Um, and that's to actually do the uh, hardware to actually run the entire AGCT of a person's cancer as compared to their healthy cells. Then there's actually a lot of uh, analysis afterwards. It's hard to say what the real price of analysis is. Today it's a lot because it's not quite algorithmic and standardized, but that, could, that price could come down. Somatic mutation uh, tumor burden is a pretty good biomarker for efficacy of PD-1 antibodies, uh, clinical response. I don't think that's a near term, but there are companies whose whole purpose is to develop better uh, biomarkers. Uh, my friend uh, Paul Tuma from UCLA, who published some of these Nature papers with uh, Tony Rebus, um, I think has developed a country specifically for the purpose of uh, uh, PD-1 antibody biomarker development. Um, I think it'll be some time before any of those is better than PD-L1. Uh, not yeah, not in the next few years. Uh, but it certainly seems like. Utilization of PDL, PD1 and PDL1 drugs is, is going fine without the selection, just delivering on the promise of efficacy. Yeah. Um, sort of taking another look at the pipeline, um, Rachel, could you show us a bit more about what's, what's coming soon and what could have the biggest impact? Certainly. What you're seeing in this chart, um, again, we're looking at immunotherapy combinations combinations with uh, any cancer immunotherapy agent, uh, be it with another immunotherapy agent, uh, uh, oncolytic virus, um, you know, CAR T-cell regimen, whatever it might be. Um, but what you're seeing specifically here are ongoing trials that are pivotal by the sponsor. And these, again, were sponsors, collaborators that were identified by their number of trial counts. Uh, but what you just see here are those sponsors that have ongoing pivotal trials, be they be the, that the trial would be closed, temporarily closed, open, or planned. Um, what I want to point out here in particular in this chart is the fact that there are some smaller companies that have some pivotal trials. Um, some of those are closed and open. You see, I mean, open or planned, excuse me, and you see that TG Therapeutics with their um, CD20 antagonist and their PI3 kinase inhibitor. Um, those, those are two, uh, three trials that they're conducting. Uh, Prima Biomed has a LAG3 antagonist. Insight has an IDO inhibitor that's planned. Immun Immunomedics has a CD20 antagonist. And Biothera, Biothera has an uh, immunostimulant in prime PGG. Um, Dr. Brady, are there any uh, particular programs that you're excited about, things that you see as really promising in development right now? I do. I'm extremely prejudiced, so let me acknowledge that, um, both by virtue of the fact that I'm a lymphoma CLL doc and sort of some things that we study in my lab, but I will try to rise above that prejudice and say one example of the classes, uh, you guys can ask me about others. Uh, are, and it's sort of listed here in a couple different ways, a uh, combination of uh, glutenothiazine kinase inhibitors with checkpoint blockade. Um, 
I don't know why that doesn't show up more here, because I know Asserta has at least six trials with Keytruda, uh, with Merck uh, using Keytruda. Asserta is one of those uh, BTK inhibitor companies. Um, so I'm sure that's reflected here in some way, maybe it's paid through Merck, I'm not sure. Um, these are just uh, the top five, 25 companies in terms of their total trial count and combination. Gotcha. Okay. Um, BTK inhibition, uh, I'll just give the very, very brief uh, one-liner of the concept here. Uh, BTK inhibition is uh, by a long, by a wide margin, uh, the most exciting and successful uh, thing in uh, hemologic malignancies, certainly in 15 years since rituximab. Um, and it's had a huge impact on the lives of many different types of uh, B-cell malignancies, CLL, disease large cell, lymphoma, mantle cell, Waldenstrom's. And, uh, and they have this other immunomodulatory effect, which we didn't initially talk about very much. While they inhibit BTK, they also inhibit other related enzymes like uh, ITK, uh, which is in T cells as opposed to B cells. Uh, and I won't go into the details, but we think that they modulate the immune system in such a way that it might be skewed towards, we say, a Th1 type response, may lend uh, that immune system, uh, may prime that immune system towards a, a greater efficacy of PD-1 blockade. So I won't go on more about it, but we think that those combinations are very promising. Again, those are pharmacyclic uh, FDA-approved BTK inhibitors. Asserta published uh, their first uh, big trial in the England Journal of Medicine recently. So BTK inhibitors, uh, from those two companies, Ono is also listed here, I imagine, for their BTK inhibitor as well. Uh, we think having an, uh, an encouraging immunomodulatory effect even beyond their uh, inhibition just of BTK uh, and could combine well. At the simplest level, we could say, why not take the greatest drug in hematology, uh, BTK inhibitor, and the greatest drug in oncology, PP1 inhibitors, uh, and combine them. You know? So when I explain it to my patients, they say, oh, yeah. And then if they don't believe that, I show them the stock ticker of pharmacyclics um, from 2007 until now, and then they agree they would like that medicine. Um, so pharmacyclic FD. Yeah, sorry, so I could call it FD now, yeah, yeah, um, as of uh, two months ago. Um, although it's funny, some of those trials are still being run by their prior partner, Janssen, um, but I don't think I would get them onto this uh, picture here. But now FD going forward, yeah. Uh, so I think those are very promising. Uh, we haven't talked much about CAR T cell therapy because those are all small and almost we call them niche markets, but I do have some optimism that they will be bigger and go beyond their niche uh, over the next couple of years. So it's, uh, we would say, uh, again, low-hanging fruit to combine uh, CAR T cells, which is just another type of anti-cancer T cell, one that's been a bit duped and tricked and genetically manipulated to fight a uh, cancer cell. Um, but they are still T cells and they are still susceptible. We, we know that they upregulate PD-1 uh, when they're activated and are susceptible to pdl one induced inhibition. So a combination of CAR T cells with PD-1 or pdl ones are, we think, a very low-hanging fruit. Uh, some CAR T cell companies are actually trying to package it all in together as long as they're manipulating the T cell to attack, in this case, CD19 positive cancers. They can also manipulate that T cell to get rid of its own PD-1 and that would be an even simpler and more elegant way of uh, PD-1 blockade on only the anti-cancer T cells, not on the anti-lung T cells, anti-skin T cells, et cetera. So it would probably be even safer, but uh, not as simple as uh, just giving uh, anti-PD-1 antibodies uh, along with CAR T cells. So that's a pretty uh, low-hanging fruit uh, combination therapy. I think the early uh, IDO-1 uh, anti-PD-1 data, we saw this last year, was pretty promising as well. Great. Rachel, you also picked out some uh near-term trials that that will be delivering in the next few years? Yes, these are closed pivotal trials. Uh, what I want to point out particularly is that of the five trials listed here, the ones in black are for drugs that have already been approved in their first indication, and they are now um, undergoing pivotal trials. They have pivotal trials for their an, an expanded indication. You can see uh, um, with those in black that their patient segment they're targeting are first-line patients, first-line untreated patients, whereas the trial that's shown in red is the uh, Primus trial for Imprime uh, PGG in combination with Herbitux or Cetuximab. And this is actually a for a first registration for first approval, and it's for second-line patients in KRAS wild-type colorectal cancer. Um, just one more item about this particular slide is that you can see in the 
uh, column to the far right is that we, these are the expect, expected time frames for their top line results. Uh, this was a uh, source from Trial Trove and Biomed Tracker. And I want to point out at the bottom with the Checkmate 67 trial with Opdivo and Yervoy that the progression-free survival and co-primary endpoint was actually already reported at ASCO 2015. And we're just waiting for the um, report on the other co-primary endpoint of overall survival. And um, we have selected one particular investigational combination to look at as a case study, Amgen's bone cyto with Mark's Keytruda in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, uh, which is the most prevalent form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, we have a partnership that also paired up Amgen's anti-colony stimulating factor one receptor antibody with Keytruda in solid tumors. Uh, Rachel, could you um, explain the rationale for combining these two agents? Uh, I think that uh, just in thinking back to what one comment that Dr. Brody made earlier is that you know the idea for combination therapy is that you are targeting different components of the um, immune system, and we can see with the checkpoint antagonist uh, Keytruda that um, you are targeting the T cell, and in combining that with the um, bispecific um, T cell engager uh, Blinfito, you are actually using or marrying those two uh, drugs to target different components of the immune patient's immune system, the T cells and the B cells excuse me, T cells, and bringing the T cells in close proximity with the cancer cells. So you're hoping, I think, as we all hope, that you're not just going to have an additive effect, but you're going to have a synergistic effect in using those two drugs. Um, we've seen this already uh, with in the Checkmate 67 trial with your boy um, and Opdivo. And I just mentioned in the last slide that the progression-free survival results for that particular pivotal trial have already been um, reported at ASCO. Uh, and we've also seen this with the Checkmate 69 trial in that the combination of Opdivo and Yervoy alone, um, or Opdivo and Yervoy together in contrast to Yervoy alone, the median progression-free survival was 8.9 .9 months versus 4.7 months. And correspondingly, the overall survival rate was much higher in the combination versus the monotherapy alone. So, put you on the spot again, Dr. Dr. Brody. Do you have any thoughts about what this potential combination uh, could bring to the table in terms of, of efficacy and safety? Sure. Uh, yeah, just to repeat what was already said, this is an elegant combination that we're looking at. It, uh, I would restate uh, the rationale in, in the sentence that uh, when cycle brings T cells to cancer, those T cells get exhausted, and like PD-1 blockade would prevent them from getting exhausted, so they could do their job effectively. Uh, Linsido um, is another version. Uh, it's not true, but it's another version of a CAR T cell. Um, they're really accomplishing the same thing. It's not. They're not technically another version, but they're accomplishing the same thing in two directions. Uh, Long Island Expressway versus Grand Central, they're really getting to the same place that T cell coming over to the cancer cell and killing by the exact same target. Um, uh, so everything I said for CAR T cells, I probably should have said for Linsider before as well uh, in terms of the combination potential with anti-PD-1. Um, whether a uh, bispecific or a CAR T cell mode one might be better than the other, I'll, I'll, I'll table that uh, consideration. So Linsido is FDA approved for ALL, a very small group of people in America. We do use it for those patients, but they would like to be used for every CD19 malignancy, every CD19 positive malignancy. The smartest one to go after is a bad one with few options, such as relapse refractory diffuse large cell lymphoma. Uh, and they have a little bit of preliminary data with diffuse large cell lymphoma. They actually had historically, when they were micromet, uh, before they were Amgen, had a fair amount of data with another bad uh, cancer, mantle cell lymphoma and had promising results with that. So uh, it's hard for me to imagine how anti-PD-1 could not improve on that efficacy. But there is then the question of their, would they have additive or synergistic toxicity? And that's a trickier one to say, because the toxicity of both these bites and CAR T cells, somewhat similar toxicity, is partly understood. We call these things sometimes cytokine release syndrome or um, 
the central nervous system toxicity is otherwise unspecified. And they have something to do, we think, with the T cell getting a little bit hyperactivated, spitting, a bunch of, spitting out a bunch of cytokines that make people get sick and go to the intensive care unit sometimes. Whether PD-1 blockade would amplify that, I don't think we know yet. So efficacy-wise, I think this is a no-brainer. I think uh, safety-wise, a little bit of a question mark still, uh, but it definitely is worth trying. And I'll just say, uh, as a caveat, we have a bit better understanding of that toxicity now. Now we treat those patients standardly with anti IL-6 receptor antibody um, and could probably do a bit better in terms of keeping those patients safe. So I have, opt I have some optimism for this. I think it's an exciting uh, concept. Thanks. Um, Rachel, could you sort of lay out for us what the plan is for moving this, uh, this combination forward? So this particular trial is planned, as stated. It's a kind of unique in that it's a phase 1B3 trial design. Uh, we've normally just seen this trial design uh, in sometimes biosimilar trials, but not necessarily in the immuno-oncology combination arena. Uh, Amgen and Merck are actually the only collaborators that have been using this design for their IO combinations. Um, we can probably expect that in the phase one portion of this um, trial that we, they will be testing for dose limiting toxicities just like you would expect in any other phase one, but they are then jumping to phase three and we do not know yet what the efficacy endpoints are. Um, since they just announced this trial in early December 2015, they we just we don't know when it's they will be initiating enrolling patients, but uh, it's exciting to see that it's going to be in um, an aggressive form of B cell lymphoma, and uh, we can stay tuned to see what's coming up next. Um, one thing I did want to comment on is the uh, toxicities that we're seeing with these combination therapies, and Dr. Brody just alluded to the fact that the, you do see higher toxicities when you combine these agents, and yet uh, now we know, and at least in his practice, he commented that it's now somewhat preventable or reversible uh, with these patients if you are using combination therapies. Is that correct? Somewhat. In that specific example I gave of, uh, and again, that's a little bit more about CAR T cells, but probably applies to these bites as well, and IL-6 receptor antibody is helpful. I would say it really makes the problem half as bad, but there's still some problem there in, uh, in CAR T cells and probably in bites as well. Uh, the cytokine release syndrome is still an addressable problem, still needs some fixing. Um, so we have, a, we have a help, we don't have a fix. Yeah. I mean, one of the major issues for, for combinations across the board is, is going to be additive toxicity. Uh, how do you see that, and you can see with the year by optical combination, um, how is that going to affect the prospects for immuno-oncology combinations with, with regard to patient uptake um, and how comfortable physicians are with uh, prescribing these drugs in combination? I, maybe I would divide them into those that we can uh, obviously foresee and those that are surprises. I hope that doesn't sound like Donald Rumsfeld when I phrase it that way, uh, but there are some that are obvious. When you add combined IPI with something, you're going to get ipilimumab, your voice, toxicity plus some more, and those are not surprises. And they're going to be at least additive, and that's a lot of toxicity, so you can't add very much to a toxic drug. Uh, when you add an IDO inhibitor that is pretty well tolerated with a PD-1 antibody that's pretty well tolerated, we would expect it to be well tolerated. The early data showed that it was. And then we have some, so those are things going in the exact way you predict. And then you have some surprises. A BRAF inhibitor plus um, ipilimumab uh, checkpoint or blockade overall was not as well tolerated as we thought it would be. And that one, uh, I wouldn't have foreseen. I'm not, I don't think anyone would have foreseen that one uh, very easily. But I think the majority of these are in the predictable group. And so when we start these combo trials and we say to them, well, you know, just go back to the BTK inhibitors plus the PD-1 antibodies that I alluded to, both pretty well tolerated medicines, you know, people taking BTK inhibitors for five years at least, you know, just like they take their Lipitor and their uh, and blood pressure medicine. Uh, so overall, hint that it's pretty well tolerated. And so far, early, early data of BTK inhibitors plus PD-1 antibodies have been, uh, as expected, well tolerated. So I think most of these will go as you expect. So if A is gentle and B is gentle, we expect A plus B will usually be gentle and we'll only have a small number of surprises. I think we are running out of time, so I would like to remind people if they have questions to um, submit them through the Q&A pane. And um, if we don't get to them, 
lives and those will be answered by email. Um, and I think, Rachel, if you wanted to give us our last question. Uh, this is along the lines of the additive toxicity issue, but also does mode of administration factor into whether or not patients are going to be um, opting for the combination therapy versus the monotherapy. Um, I think the infusion rate for um, uh, what was it? Linsito, um sure. was 24 hours. Uh, so people actually hooked up to their Blincyto for weeks. So they have to, right now we do the first, I think, nine days in the hospital, then they take the piggyback thing home and can do it at home for the uh, last three weeks. So that's a big deal. That has been Blincyto's you know, maybe foremost obstacle to getting into less terrible cancers. If you have a terrible ALL and you're going to die otherwise in two months, then you're happy to do what you have to do. But yeah, getting into other cancers, that's been a hurdle. Yeah, that will affect its ability to go into other cancers. So, for example, low-grade lymphoma, where you have an option of a pill or going to the hospital for nine days, uh, that will definitely have an impact there. So it depends on how bad your cancer is. Uh, but lymphoma, that's sort of the extreme of uh, inconvenient uh, route of administration. Yeah. I think we've got time for one more from the audience. Is a, I'm going to paraphrase a general question um, for Patty about um, deal trends and, and what you're seeing. Uh, happened there? Well, <clears throat> I think in the last year we saw some really uh, large deals with a lot of money up front. Um, we also saw from Rachel's slides that there are a lot of open trials, some closed, and I think this year the focus will really be on, you know, looking at results, seeing what's working, if anything is, and then possibly, you know, a new focus on second generation you know, oncology drugs, and if uh, something pops up as being really promising, I think we might see a shift uh, from partnerships to uh, m and Oh, interesting. Um, well, we are, we are out of time, so we're gonna, I'm going to thank you very much for joining us today, and if you have any further questions or comments, please email them to pharma at informa.com. Um, I'll thank you all again, uh, both our panelists and everybody who's dialed in, and have a great rest of the day.